summer. This Family Fest is going to be a treasure hunt, so you and your family will be able to explore Messiah's campus, collecting treasures. We ask that you RSVP for this family event. It's going to be fun for bigs and littles. We hope that you'll join us, so just visit the events page on messiahstcharles.org to sign your family up. Also this afternoon is the first Messiah PM event of the season. It's a big volleyball tournament. So high school students, we hope you have a lot of fun today. But right now it's time for us to worship. Whether you are joining us online or here in person, if you are new, we would love to give you a gift and answer any questions that you have about Messiah. So just text the word welcome to the number on your screen or visit anybody who's wearing a teal Messiah host shirt and we will help you out. Our biography series today continues with Susanna Wesley, and Pastor Jim is going to be teaching us about what made her so special, what did she contribute to our world, and how we can have some of the same characteristics in our lives as we follow Jesus. So join me in turning your hearts and your minds today to worship Him. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Messiah. Listen, on the way into church this morning, I was so blessed. I heard the sound of birds uh, singing, and it just really affected me. It was wonderful. And I was thinking, you know, we can have that effect on the Lord when we sing and we worship. When we're singing, that blesses the Lord. And don't you want to bless the Lord this morning? Let's stand and let's sing and let's give Him our whole heart as we worship Him.
Let's come before our Lord to confess our sins and receive forgiveness. We pray. Our Father in heaven, before we get too far along in our time of worship today, we need to spend some time with you in prayer because we want to be honest with you. We want to admit that we have fallen short of your glory in many, many ways this week. We haven't acted very much like Jesus. We have failed again and again and again, and yet, and yet, those beautiful words, and yet, and yet we know that you have forgiven us everything and that you never grow tired of forgiving us over and over and over again. We thank you for forgiving us our trespasses. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my friends in Christ, uh, receive this great good news that we have confessed our sin before the Lord, and he has heard our prayer, and because of his everlasting love, God sent his one and only son into the world to live for you and to die for you and to rise again for you so that you would have life and so that you would have life to the full. So live forgiven and free because you are forgiven and free. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now confess who we believe God to be, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by confessing together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. We are continuing our biography series, and uh, I think I've said this to Chuck a couple times. Man, every week it just gets better and better. And I, I think you're going to find that throughout the series, just even characters like today, Susanna Wesley, maybe, maybe none of you have heard of Susanna Wesley, and so it's my real pleasure to tell her story and to, to find the ways in which God worked through her and what that might tell us about uh, how we're supposed to live our Christian lives today, because one thing's for sure, God has always had plans for his people, and he wants to use his people. And for that, I want to turn to the scriptures. I want to turn to the Psalms. Now, the Psalms are not normally a place that you would preach from. Uh, the Psalms are, is meant to be a hymn book. This is a hymn book. So each of these would be songs or, or poetry that's meant to inspire. It's a way to praise God. It's a, it's a way to pray to God. Uh, some of the Psalms are used to confess sin. Some of the Psalms are used to simply complain to God. You're, you're crying out to God for help. But this one from Psalm 71 is one of my favorites, and I think it so well shows the life of Susanna. The psalmist writes, my mouth will tell of your righteous deeds, of your saving acts all day long. Though I know not how to relate them all, I will come and proclaim your mighty acts, sovereign Lord. I will proclaim your righteous deeds, yours alone. And since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds, even when I am old and gray. Do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. This is God's word. Susanna Wesley was born in 1669 in England, and she was the 25th of 25 children. Honey, we have four kids. She was the 25th of 25 children, and she was the daughter of a preacher. She was married when she was 19 years old, and she had 19 children herself. Chuck, you had five kids, 19 children herself, but nine of her children died as infants, which was often the case then. Whenever people complain about today, I remind them of these kinds of things, that as a parent, you would expect often in early, early childhood to lose maybe half your children. And it's not even that long ago, just a few hundred years ago. 19 children, she lost nine as infants. And at her death, only eight of her children were still alive. And for any parent that's lost a child, Susanna shows your pain. She knows it is the, a mother's worst fear is to have to bury one of her own. Susanna buried many of them. Although she never preached a sermon or published officially a book during her lifetime, she never founded a church, she is known as the mother of Methodism, the Methodist church, the mother of Methodism. Why? Well, it's because of her two sons, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, which maybe you've heard a bit more about them. They were the founders of the Methodist church. Now, although their dad was a preacher, mom was really the spiritual leader of the home. Susanna experienced many hardships throughout her life. Her husband, the preacher, left her and the children for over a year because of a minor dispute that they had. Samuel Wesley spent time in jail twice 
because of poor financial handlings. And the lack of money was a continual struggle for Susanna as she raised her 10 kids who were still alive. Their house was burned down twice, once almost killing her son John, the future father of the Methodist church. Uh, Rumor has it, it was done by church members one of the times who hated Samuel's preaching and said he was getting a little too political. Don't get any ideas out there. But can you imagine the church members you're called to serve and to share God's word with actually burning down your home? But Susanna taught her kids well, and she made sure that they all learned Latin Greek, and all the classical studies, daughters included, which was quite rare back then, and it's probably quite rare today. All her kids were very educated, and this was very near and dear to her heart. Now, there was a lack of diverse spiritual teaching at their church, and it caused Susanna afterwards to assemble her children every Sunday afternoon for family services, what we might call the first kind of Sunday school. She just didn't think her kids were getting it, and she didn't think the worship was relevant for them. So she would gather her kids, and they would sing a psalm, and then Susanna would read a sermon from either her husband's files or her dad's old preaching files. And then they would follow it up by singing another psalm. The local people began to ask if they could attend too, not just the kids, the adults included. And at one point... There were over 200 people who would gather at their home for Susanna's Sunday afternoon home Bible study. All at that time, church attendance was dwindling drastically down. Her home Bible study was bigger than the church by far. It was so embarrassing for her husband, the pastor, that he asked her to stop leading the Bible study that was larger than his church attendance. She told him, if this study is going to stop, she won't be the one to do it. He better command it as her husband and as the pastor. Because when they get to the throne of the Lord, she said, they had to answer to God why they stopped doing this good thing that was leading to other good things in the world. Samuel wasn't willing to go that far. He feared the throne of God. And after her weekly sermon reading studies continued... Uh, John uh, later was known as Methodist, her son John Wesley. He was known as a Methodist because of the methodical way that he studied God's Word. But he learned it all from his mom, Susanna Wesley. Susanna wrote extended commentaries on the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, kind of like an early catechism, all so that she could disciple her kids better. And her writings were preserved by Charles Wallace to this day, at least some of them. Now, there's one verse in particular that I think really shows off her faith in her life. And it's from verse 18 of the psalm we just read. It says, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come, and to those who will come after them, and those who will come after them. She wanted to proclaim the word of God to the next generation. She cared about the future of the church, which when I think about Messiah and the values that we have been working in, we've been praying over, we've been trying to teach, like these are the values that answer the question, why are we a church? Because there's lots of churches in America There's lots of churches in St. Charles County. There's lots of Lutheran churches in St. Charles County. Surely we don't need another one. So why do we exist? And the reason is because of these values. We value these things. These are unique. These are what God is calling us to become. This is who God has already made us in to be. We're the kind of church where found people find people. We're saved people serve people. We're faith in real life intersect, where life is better connected, and where the next generation matters now. 
Now, I asked our staff this week, we had our end of the school year staff meeting, and we had a little fun afterwards as well, and I asked them, what would you say are the opposite of those values? Like, if this is the kind of church Messiah is, a church where found people find people and save people, want to serve people, and where faith and real life, what would be the opposite of those values? And there was a lot of ideas, but it goes a little something like this. If we're the kind of church where found people find people, what would be the opposite? A church where lost people stay lost. I've been to churches that it seems that way. Like, they really don't want people that don't know Jesus to come around. They don't really want them there. If we're the kind of church where saved people need to serve people, what about a church where selfish people serve themselves? I've seen that before. Or where faith and real life, they stay separate. Monday through Saturday is different. Sunday is the faith day, but they have to stay separate. Where if life is better connected, what if life is better alone? I think especially during COVID, a lot of people are very alone. They choose to be alone. God doesn't want that for us. And instead of a church where the next generation matters now, a church where the kids need to sit still and be quiet. Man, that's not Messiah. That is not Messiah. We want to make sure we're raising up the next generation. They matter right now, or they're not going to matter later. She referred to her time with her kids as like the parable of the talents. What are you going to do with the parable of the talents? If God gives you five talents, you're just going to bury it in the sand and then later on dig it up when when God comes back and say, I've got it for you, God. I didn't lose any of it. I still got that precious gift of salvation that you gave me. Susanna's like, no way. The parable of the talents says you have to invest it. Think about the one who had the one talent. That's exactly what he did. He buried it in the ground, and he just tried to preserve the thing. The thing is, we're not meant to preserve our faith. You only preserve pickles. You don't preserve the faith. You pass on the faith. You invest in the faith. That's what the parable of the talents is all about. And that's why the one who had five now had ten, and then the owner even comes to him and says, I'm going to give you the one that the guy who didn't even want to invest it, I'm going to give you his. He ended up with more. So Susanna believed the parable of the talents has a lot to do with how you parent and how you disciple your kids. We know her best because of her influence over her sons, because John and Charles became quite famous. These two brothers, they said at the time, they saved the world. They made sure that Christianity was relevant and helpful for real people's lives. Charles Wesley is credited with writing thousands of hymns of the church, many of which we still sing today in churches. He was and is the most voluminous hymn writer in history, Charles Wesley. Uh, You can't open a hymnal in any church body without finding some of his hymns, like some of my favorites, the Easter hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, and the Christmas carol, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Now, John Wesley is regarded as maybe the greatest preacher ever. He preached to nearly a million people in over 42,000 sermons, and he wrote hundreds of publications to help other preachers understand the Bible better. He was the definition of a circuit preacher. He went around the world. During his ministry, John Wesley rode a horse over 250,000 miles to preach. That's the equivalent of going around the equator of the earth 10 times. And he did it all on horseback. Later in life, at the age of 70, this five foot three, 128 pound Englishman preached the message of salvation to 32,000 people with no microphone. Five foot three, 128 pounds. I could eat him for lunch. But Susanna, she raised her kids who loved the Lord. And that included the greatest hymn writer in the history of the church and maybe the greatest traveling evangelist in the history of the church. This is what John had to say about mom. John said, 
I learned more about Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. Moms, that's the kind of impact you can have on the faith of your kids. Just bring it to them. Talk to him about it. That's who she was. And these are the three great lessons I think John learned from his mom. She always, always emphasized these in his life. Number one, you have to become the gospel. It's not enough to just believe the, bo- the gospel. You're supposed to become the gospel. The gospel is not some theoretical idea out there. It's not some philosophy. Christians are called to become the gospel. That's what Christian means. Christian means a little Christ. You're not Christ, but you're called to become a little Christ. When people see you, they see a little bit of Christ in you. They see the one that you're pointing to. They see a reflection of God, maybe dimly, as Paul writes, but they see a reflection of the God who loves them and who cares for them. That's who we're called to be. We have to not just believe in a concept about the gospel, we actually become the gospel. Number two, all I have is God's. And number three, all of life is valuable. Now think about become the gospel. John was raised by his mom to believe in the gospel and to become it. It wasn't enough to believe in the concept of forgiveness or the idea of grace or a theology of love. No, we're called to forgive. We're called to offer grace and love to those around us. The gospel is always meant to be believed and to be behaved. And this is what Susanna said. She said, there's two things about the gospel. Believe it and behave it. Number two, all I have is God's. John was raised by his mom to be generous. When he began to work, he was paid 30 pounds, 30 British pounds, but he found he could live on 28, and so he would give two away. Later on, his salary doubled, but he still thought he could live on 30, so he gave away half his income. Because of his publishing and his preaching, John earned more than 30,000 British pounds in his lifetime. He became quite wealthy, but he gave almost all of it away because he didn't need to live on more. In fact, he was often audited by the taxmen, the IRS of his day, because they simply couldn't believe it. The government wanted a cut of his check, but he kept giving it away, and there was nothing left to tax. And John said this, not how much of my money will I give to God, but how much of God's money will I keep for myself? Again, he learned all that from his mom. And then her third life lesson, all life is valuable. John was raised by his mom to see value in all people, regardless of race. In fact, his last known letter, written at the age of 88, was to William Wilberforce, a member of parliament in England. John said that slavery is the execrable sum of all villainies. At a time when that view was not popular, at a time that the U.S. would still have slavery almost 50, 60, 70 years later. And for William Wilberforce, he said that he had to fight against it. John called him as a man of faith to fight against it. No matter how many opponents are, if it is God's will, and it is, then nothing can stop you from doing God's will. So Wilberforce began to fight against slavery openly, was often chided and made fun of in Parliament, and he did it for 17 years until it was finally illegal in England. See, Susanna made a difference in the lives of her children that is now continuing to make a difference in the world today. She shows that we're not the sum of our accomplishments, but rather by the legacy we pay forward the legacy that we set in motion that will change the future. And today, there's more than 80 million Methodists worldwide. This woman, her influence can be felt in social reform that have made the world a better place. Yes, the abolition of slavery is is a big part of that, but it also includes penal and criminal reform, the end of child labor in England, 
Laws against cruelty to animals. That was the Wesley family that talked about that for the first time. And the establishment of societies that cared for the poor and the suffering, including orphanages, hospitals, and the like. I think about the the four people we've read through their biographies over the last four weeks. Pope John Paul II, he taught us about humility, that a Christian is called to be humble underneath God. And then with Joan of Arc, she had courage. It was faith-filled, but it was courage that stood out about her. Last week with Eric Liddell, Eric Liddell kept his priorities straight. Everybody else would have said the Olympics is the most important thing today, and Eric would continue to tell the world the most important thing every day is my God. It's always my God. And even if the rest of the world is planning huge events on the day that I call holy, the day that I worship, I'm going to keep my priorities straight. And today with Susanna, it's her methodical parenting, Methodist, her methodical parenting. She was very intentional with how she raised and prayed for and discipled her children. She lived out that value, the faith of the next generation matters now, and she paid it forward into the future. One of the best places I know to find teaching on this is in the New Testament, And it's the relationship between Paul and Timothy. See, this is several years after Jesus has left the earth and Paul's become a lead disciple. He's become the greatest missionary. He's taking the gospel to all parts of the earth. But he knows he can't do it alone. And so he raises up other evangelists, other church planters like Timothy. He took Timothy as disciple and then later on his co-worker in preaching. See, Paul knew it was one thing for for Paul to make disciples, but it's quite another if he can make disciples who make disciples. And by the way, that's the difference between churches that make a real difference in the world. It's when members stop seeing themselves as sheep and instead start to see themselves as shepherds, as disciples who make disciples. If we do that, the gospel takes off, and Paul knew that. And Timothy's name appears as a co-author in several books of the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. See, Paul knew that investing in the next generation is paramount for the future of the church. The elder discipled the young, and the young discipled the old. They, They patterned their relationship, their mentorship on that. I think all of us need a Timothy. And all of us need a Paul. We need a Timothy, somebody that we're investing in, somebody that we're discipling, somebody that we're mentoring and raising up. But we also need a Paul, somebody who's mentoring us, somebody who's challenging us to grow, somebody who's discipling us, somebody who who pours wisdom into us. We all need a Timothy, and we all need a Paul. And what's great is that Paul was able to find this not guy, not, not from the region where he was from, but in the region of Turkey, a place that was ready for missionary work, and Timothy knew the culture, and those church plants went crazy. So how did Timothy come to know the faith, and why did Paul choose him? Paul tells us in the book of 2 Timothy, he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith. And it first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded it lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God. Timothy was getting mentored at home by his grandmother and his mother, and Paul knew that if it was time to fan that into flame, Timothy could be used by God to change the world. Fan and to flame the gift of God. What happens when you fan a flame? It spreads. It spreads like crazy. It catches wildfire. To do what? To spread the gospel of salvation. That's what Paul was encouraging Timothy to do. The free gift of salvation for all who believe. Why is it free? Paul continues, because it is a gift of God. 
through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus paid for it. And now Jesus wants to give it away, and he's calling us to do it. I think about it. That little investment so long ago spread the gospel throughout Turkey and then southern Europe to the places where where my grandfathers and my grandmothers came from, and eventually it came to me. And I'm so thankful that that message of love was shared by Christians who cared enough to bring others into the faith. It was the kind of church where found people find people. They didn't say to the lost, hey, stay lost. No, no. They wanted found people to find people. And Paul was telling Timothy, let's fan the flame so that other people can get on fire for the Lord, so that no one would perish, so that everyone can have eternal life. And so today, that's my call. Let's remember the lives of those who have fanned flames. Mothers like Lois and Eunice and Susanna Wesley, who raised missionaries like Timothy and John and Charles Wesley, people that invested the gospel for the future, people who wanted to make a difference for the cause of Christ. So final question, who's your Timothy? Who's your Paul? And how is God calling you to invest it for the future of his church. Messiah, this has been the craziest year. The craziest year. And today, after church at noon, we have a voters meeting. And what we're going to do is we're going to put in a new plan for the future of Messiah. And God is going to fan that flame. I am so excited about our church. Our school is growing in the midst of a pandemic. Our budget is is strong. Our staff is on fire. We have more people serving right now. There was a time where as staff, we felt very alone last year because people weren't in the building. And now people are starting to come back. We need to praise our God. We need to thank our God for everything that he's doing. And we need to make sure that our priorities are his priorities, that we're doing that methodical thing that Susanna taught us to do. God bless you, everyone. We love you. I'm going to invite Pastor Chuck up now to pray for us and to finish up our worship service. I hope you all have a great week and a great summer. Amen. That was good stuff. That was just excellent. That was just excellent, beautiful, wonderful. Let's pray. Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for calling us out of darkness and into your marvelous lights, our joy to walk with Jesus. And for those of us who are parents and, and grandparents, we thank you for the privilege of uh, raising up our children and, and the way they should go. But we also thank you as church, as a body of believers here at Messiah, that uh, you've given us the, the noble task, the wonderful gift to, to make a difference, especially for the next generation, because their faith matters now. And we thank you for that awesome responsibility. It's, uh, it's our privilege. Uh, we pray that you would help us uh, to to grow in grace, uh, to follow the, the ways of our Lord, to love him, to learn from him, and to live for him. Open our eyes to the needs uh, around us. Open our eyes to uh, more and more Timothys, and open our eyes to uh, Pauls who can mentor us. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings of your church. We pray for uh, churches here in our community and uh, around the country and around the world so that many more are connected to Jesus and that your name would be praised. Lord of all tender mercies, you know our prayers, uh, the prayers in our hearts and our minds for those in our lives who are struggling right now with various health concerns. And, and so we ask that you would graciously heal those who are battling cancer, those who are hospitalized, those who are awaiting surgery, or those who are recuperating at home. We ask that you calm all fears and grant strength for body and rest for each soul, knowing that you are good and that nothing is impossible with you for you are the very present help in time of trouble. And Lord of the church, we ask for your spirit and your blessing as we gather today for our annual meeting. As Pastor Jim said, to make your plans our plans and your will our will. Help us with our decision making so that we may continue to serve you and our neighbors. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and continue with the words that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, this morning we'll conclude uh, with, a, with a blessing, but it will be uh, sung to you and with you and for you and to one another. Perfect song for today as we pray, as we sing about the next generation and uh, God's blessings in it. And so I invite you to please rise. We'll conclude with the blessing.